Okay, guys, so welcome to um, tonight's lesson, Mac 4862. Sorry, not Mac, FAC 4862, FAC 4864. Um, tonight we'll do the first lesson on revenue. So revenue is a significant topic um, from a CTA point of view, as well as from a real world point of view, if you can become an accountant. Okay, so um, if you're going into the world of um, financial accounting, in investments um, as an investment analyst or as an auditor, revenue is a, a significant um, number for a business. And as a result, as an accountant, you have to prepare financial statements. As um, an auditor, you will have to audit financial statements. As um, an investment analyst, you will analyze the revenue number quite deeply. So you will need to know how a company comes up with their revenue number by knowing the, 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 the applicable accounting standard. So IFRS 15 is a significant standard. In terms of SICA, it is basically on, on a level three, I think they call it, whatever the levels are, meaning the highest level. So you must be able to, um, you must know revenue basically on SICA's highest level. Not necessarily know the entire standard like a guru, but you must know quite a bit of the standard on Psyche's highest level. So that means be able to apply a, um, revenue to a complex scenario. So what you should know, revenue is a big standard um, and likely so it is one of the main numbers from a business point of view. That is how a company makes money. So the standard applicable to revenue is IFRS 15 contracts with customers. The standard is not itself, the standard itself is not that long, but remember that um, an entire standard is made up of, if it's an IFRS standard, the, the entire standard is made up of the section relating to specifically the standard, then appendix A, which is um, the definitions, and then appendix B, which is the application guidance. There will also be Appendix C, but that is basically transition stuff like when to apply IFRS 15 and all of those type of things. So, but for our purposes, Appendix B, application guidance, Appendix A, the definitions, and then the standard itself. So those three things together with the other like Appendix C and so forth, those um, sections make up the entire standard of an IFRS. So the same thing would apply to IFRS 3. The same thing would apply to IFRS 10. The same thing would apply to IFRS 11, IFRS 9, and so forth. Okay, IFRS 16 leases. So the same um, thing will apply. You have a standard which is quite short, giving you a high level overview of what the standard is about and giving you the principles relating to the particular standard. Then you have Appendix A, which defines all the terms. And then Appendix B, which is the application guidance, that's where is all the meat. That generally takes the bulk of the standard because they take the principles that was explained in the standard part and in the standard section and um, they apply it basically in the application guidance, how to further understand it. So it's very important that you read IFRS 15, at least as a starting point read the standard section, but eventually you want to get to the application guidance, because basically most of the questions is coming out of the application guidance in terms of um, applying the standard. Okay, so it's very important. Also, take note that um, in your books, you would also have like the basis of conclusion, you would have um, dissenting opinions, and then you have illustrative examples. Now the basis of conclusion, and the dissenting opinions, those are not part of the st standard. The base of conclusion just gives you uh, the reasoning as to how um, the board came up with the standard. The dissenting opinions is just basically the people that disagreed with the final principle that was with the final standard. So some stuff has been selected, they are board, they have to vote, I'm assuming, and not everybody's gonna agree with something so they show the dissenting opinions, um, why this person disagreed and why the board still went ahead by 
um, not taking into account the dissenting opinion. So that is not part of the standard. Similarly, the illustrative examples is not part of a standard. So when you argue something, you can't use those things as part of your argument because you're not using the standard. That doesn't form part of the standard. That being said, from an IFRS 15 point of view, I think it's about 79 or 73 um, or 63 um, illustrative examples. Please make sure you read, you go through those because a lot of the questions come from there and you literally can go to the example, look up what the stand, what, um, what is being um, said in the example and apply it to an answer. So just make sure you cover those, um, those illustrative examples. Very important for um, I for S15. When you work through it, if you work through the, those examples and you work through the various questions, you will see what I'm saying. A lot of the questions, that is a calculation base, comes from the illustrative examples. So make sure you go through them. So this week, tonight, we're going to cover I4S15. Um, we're going to cover the basic aspects of I4S15. Then next week, we're going to continue with the more um, with, uh, with, with some more further details, something beyond the basics. So the basics of I4S15 is basically applying revenue, which is the five-step model. Okay, so you must know the five-step model and how to apply it. Take note that they will ask you the five-step model, but they're not interested in you regurgitating the five-step model. You're going to mention it, but there's no marks for mentioning the five-step model. The marks lie in the application thereof. So just make sure you are able to apply the five-step model. You must know it, but there's zero marks for knowing the five-step model. All the marks come in applying the five-step model. Once again, the application guidance will give you some further details as to how apply the five-step model. So now, in the next 15 to 20 minutes, we're going to go through the five-step model. Um, that is what we will cover for today, and we'll cover a, a short question. And then next week, we will continue with a, um, with a five, uh, with, with the further implications of the five-step model, as well as any things like modifications and all of those type of things. So we're not going to deal with sophistications, com um, complications tonight. The sophistication and the complications and the further, um, the further um, things relating to um, IFRS 15 will be covered next week. I will check my schedule because we probably have to bring in another th a third lesson over a weekend on revenue so we can cover some more aspects. Um, but I'll confirm that with you. But if there's no, if there's no space, then I'm going to upload extra things that you need to do for IFRS 15 because for IFRS 15 is huge, 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 huge. Um, what you must know, out of test two, 30 marks is going to go for I4S15. 10 marks will be for um, for joint ventures, okay? I mean, joint arrangements. So just take note, I4S15 must be the, the, your, your, your focus. More importantly, they are more focused on, you must be able to calculate, don't get me wrong, but they are more focusing on a discussion point of view. So you must be able to do the calculations, but you must also be able to discuss. Now remember, your discussion is not verbal. Your discussion is written. So just take note of that, okay? So now we're gonna go into the five-step model. The five-step model is basically, um, number one, you must, um, there, there has to be a contract, Number two, you need to identify the performance obligations. Number three, you have to determine the transaction price. Number four, you need to allocate the transaction price. And then number five, you need to um, recognize revenue. Now, the big marks is all five, okay? But the big marks is generally number two, step two, um, step three and four, okay? So those are generally the big marks, two, three, and four, okay? And then five can be big, um, but it's, five can also be big, but basically two, three, and four is generally your big ones, okay? So there has to be a contract 
with a customer. Step one is all about having a contract with a customer. Now there's various things, various stuff that goes into a contract with a customer. It's not as simple, but from a high level point of view, a contract is if there's a written contract, if there's an oral verbal contract, or simply a contract as a result of normal business practice. For example, if you look at you and I that go shop, that go shop at Woolworths, Truitts, Pick and Pay, ShopRite, Spa, Foshini, wherever else you go shopping, there's no physical written contract between us as the customer and Pick and Pay in those stores. However, in terms of I4S15, there is a contract between us and those retailers based on normal business practice. Okay, so even though there's no written contract, that we, when we're transacting with them, either it's a verbal oral thing or it is a normal business practice that we are entering into a contract. So pick and pay is entering into a contract with me when I go shop over there. So that transaction when I pay for goods is considered a contract in terms of I4S 15. So it is a contract with a customer. So just take note of that. You will have in, in, in other examples, for example, if you um, take out a phone contract, if you take out internet, um, what else? Phone contract, internet, there will generally be a, a contract that you sign with a service provider. So that is clear cut. There is a contract. So it's a contract with a customer. What makes us a customer is that we are transacting with a business in terms of a normal, the ordinary business operations. Okay, so just take note of that. That is a contract with a customer. Like I said, there's many other aspects over there, but that's the key thing. Then we go to step two, and here we need to spend some time. Step two is that you need to um, that you need to identify the performance obligations. Very, very critical. Okay, you need to identify your performance obligations. The performance obligations. Um, are identified at, at the inception of the contract. So when you enter into the contract, not necessarily when the things are provided, but when the contract is entered into, that is when you have to identify the performance obligations. Okay. So the, 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 the question over here is, do we have one performance obligation? Or do we have more than one performance obligation? So it's very important that you use certain terminology to draw marks but not just about that, use the, the terminology that the standard has um, so that it, it makes sense, okay? And also take note again, that this standard has specific terminology. Now, if you are speaking to a CEO that is an engineer, have no background in accounting, then even though you will use this terminology, you still need to mean, speak to him or write to him as if he's a layman, okay? So in simple terms, but then you also, maybe in brackets, you give the specific terminology. So i 4 15 stipulates that in order to determine, um, the, to, in order to identify or determine your performance obligations, you need to identify whether, a, whether the goods or services that is provided within the contract and they don't use the word provided, they use the word promised. So whether the goods or service, the goods or services promised in the contract are distinct. So if they are distinct, then you will have a, you will have more than one performance obligation. If they are not distinct, then you will have one performance obligation. Now, two criteria needs to be met in order for goods or services to be distinct. The first one is goods or services, um, goods or services are capable of being distinct. What does that mean? So criteria number one, what makes a good or service distinct? If it is capable of being distinct. Now, what makes a good or service capable of being distinct? That is if it can be consumed or if it can be sold separately. So, for example, if you go to um, if you go to Mercedes Benz, 
or any car or automobile and you buy a vehicle, you can either buy the vehicle on its own or you can buy the vehicle with a, warrant, um, a maintenance plan. Similarly, I can have a, um, a vehicle and my maintenance plan come to an end. I can most likely go to the dealership, to the dealership and ask to extend my maintenance plan. So as a result, those items are, um, those, um, the, the maintenance plan and the vehicle are distinct, why? Because they are capable of being distinct. What makes them capable of being distinct? They can be sold separately, okay? So just take note of that. That's criteria number one. A good or service is distinct if it meets criteria number one and criteria number two. Criteria number one is whether the goods or services are capable of being distinct. What makes it capable of being distinct? if it can be sold separately. There's other stuff as well. That's the typical one that you will come across. The second thing is, um, the goods or services must be distinct within the context of the contract. So first criteria, is it, um, is it, is it capable of being distinct? Yes, happy. Then you go to the next. Um, is these, are these goods or services that are distinct distinct within the context of the contract. So what does that mean? Let's take, for example, a, um, a, construction, a construction company, okay? A construction company, um, if, you, if, you, if you go to them, so let's say you are um, you into, you, you into a, the property business, right? Um, and so now you want a property to be built, but you don't build your own properties. You hire a property developer to build or to develop your properties. Now the property developer, let's say you're using one that is quite um, established. So they would have their own um, land surveyors. They would have their own, um, uh, they would have their own land surveyors, their own engineering teams, their own, um, uh, what else, architecture, architecture teams and their own project management. So basically, if you, go to, if you go on to a property developer or architect company, they will show you the various services they offer, engineering, architecture, landscaping, um, project management. Each of those services you can um, obtain separately. So when you enter into a, um, a contract with um, a property developer to develop a property for you, they have all of those um, services. So all of those services are distinct. Why? Because they are, being, they are capable of being distinct. What makes them capable of being distinct is that you can obtain them separately. You can um, buy those services separately or seek those services separately. You don't have to take everything. But criteria number two says, um, in order for a good to be distinct, it must also meet criteria number two. What is criteria number two? That the goods or services that are distinct are distinct within the context of the, 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 within the context of the contract. When you, as the company, the property company, entering into the contract with the property developer, you're not asking them for engineering services. You're not asking them for landscape services. You're not asking them for project management. You enter into a contract with them to deliver a completed property. That is what you, so your contract with them is they must deliver a completed property. So from the property developer side, they like, okay, yes, we need to, it is, um, we need, in order to deliver a, a property, we need all of those separate services. However, within the context of the contract, those services are no longer distinct because we are not providing the separate services for the, um, for the company, for, for the customer, but rather we are having all of those services or utilizing all of those services in order to deliver what the contract wants, and that is a completed property. 
So just take note of that. In order for a good or services to be distinct, it must meet both criteria. So just take note of that. Okay. So number one, um, step number one, identify a contract. It has to be a contract with a customer. I think um, step number two, because remember you can have a contract, pick and pay can have a contract with someone when they sell a second hand vehicle. That is not a, um, they don't fall in eye for this 15 because they don't sell vehicles in the ordinary course of business. They're just selling an old vehicle because they want to replace a new vehicle, but that is not the ordinary course of business. So it must be a, a contract with a customer. So that's number one. Number two, determine the, identify the performance obligations. You do it at the at inception of the contract. So when the contract is entered into or agreed upon. So how is it? You will have separate performance obligations if the goods or services are distinct. What makes goods or services distinct? Two things. Number one, they are capable of being distinct and they are distinct within the context of a contract. Like we gave the example of, um, like we gave the example of the, 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 the construction company. Number three, step three of the model, of the revenue model is to determine the transaction price, okay? You have to determine the transaction price of, um, you have to determine the transaction price of the, um, of, the, of the contract. And basically to determine the transaction price, there are four things you will take into account. Okay, so what are the four things you must take into account? So obviously the, whatever they, they make mention, but any variable consideration. A, so like variable consideration, financing, all of these stuff, we will deal with in further um, in the next lesson when you're going to the details of these kind of um, specific spe specifications, but just on a high level, a variable consideration. A variable consideration that refers to um, if there's a discount, if there's any rebates, if there is um, for an asset management company, performance, um, before, um, performance fees, um, bonuses, those type of things. Okay, so volume rebates in a retailer. So retailers have lots of volume rebates. So that is a, a the, those are all variable considerations. Okay, so when you look at the transaction price, you must factor in variable consideration. Number two, you must factor in any significant financing component. They will tell you when, when something yeah, has a significant financing component. So for example, um, you are providing a service now and, and the customer is only going to pay you a year later. And that year later is considered a significant, um, uh, is considered, no, um, considered beyond normal credit terms. So as a result, there will be a financing component. We need to obviously then work out the present value. Number three, any non-cash consideration. So you may not be paying cash, you may be transferring another asset or something. So then you have to factor in any non-cash consideration. And then finally, you must, you must take into account any consideration that you as the company providing the service may have to pay the customer. So for example, you could have to, um, you may have a situation where you have a refund policy, or you may have a situation where um, in, in maybe in the construction business, there's, you have a situation where you, um, you may incur penalties if you deliver late or something of that nature. Those are all considered, um, those are all considered um, consideration payable to a customer. So just take note, when you look at the transaction price, there are those four main criteria to have a look at. And each of those will have different things included. Another variable consideration aspect would be um, a loyalty program. So just take note of those type of stuff. All of these nitty gritty things we'll focus on when we deal more with, with the specific issues. So, so far we have the three components, okay? Um, Step one, the contract. Step two, um, what was step two again? Identify or determine the performance obligation. Step three, it is um, determining the transaction price. Now we come into step four. 
So in step two, we identified or determined the performance obligations. In step three, we determined the transaction price. Now we come to step four. Step four is all about allocating that one transaction price amongst the various performance obligations. The way you would do it is in a two-step two approach. The first thing is to determine the standalone selling prices. In most cases, for our purposes, that's going to be given. In the real world, it's not given. Okay. So step one is to determine the the, uh, the standalone selling prices. And then step two is to use the standalone selling prices to allocate the transaction price to the performance obligations. So for example, a typical example would, would be as follows. You go to, sell, uh, to Vodacom or MTN and you take out a cell phone contract. The cell phone contract says that you're gonna pay um, 1,000 Rand a month you're going to pay 1,000 Rand a month, you're going to get a cell phone or a mobile phone or a smartphone, um, as well as a, as well as a, um, as well as data. Okay, so let's say it is one gig data, just to simplify. So it's 1,000 Rand a month for 24 months. Um, as part of the contract, you are getting a um, a mobile phone as well as one gig data. So we apply step number one, there is a contract, there's a physical contract you're signing, are you a customer? Yes, why? You are transacting with MTN or Vodacom in, in a normal course of business. So step one, met. Step number two, identify the performance obligations. In order to, to determine or identify the performance obligations, we need to assess whether um, the goods or services promised within the contract are distinct. So what are the goods or services promised within the contract? A handset or the mobile phone and, and one gig data. The question you need to ask, are those two items distinct? How do you know if those two items are distinct? If they meet the two, the two criteria for being distinct. Number one, are those two items capable of being distinct? And it's quite obvious that they should be capable of being distinct because if you go to um, MTN, you can just buy the phone. If you go to MTN, you can just take out a data contract. So they are capable of being distinct. Why? They are sold separately. Number two, um, number two, um, what's number two again? Um, are the goods that are distinct, distinct within the context of the contract? So the way you'll have a look, what are they are to deliver? They are just to deliver a phone and um, they are only to, to deliver the phone and um, the, the data. They are not so interrelated that if you leave the one out, the other one is um, impacted. So if you just get the phone, the phone can work without the data. Why? Because you can get data somewhere else. You can use your Wi-Fi at home. You can go to cell C or you can go to MTN or you can, or you can go to um, telecom and get data there if you want a different SIM card. So without having the data, no problem. If you do, if without having a phone, you can still use the data, but you can just take the SIM card and use it in another phone. So as you can see, those um, the two items are not so interrelated that they can't function on their own. So as a result, um, the, the goods are distinct within the context of the contract. They're not so interrelated that they, are, that they, um, that they won't operate with um, one without the other. So therefore, they meet um, this contract meets the, these goods, these goods or services promised within the contract are distinct because they meet both criteria. So therefore we have two performance obligations, the handset and the data contract. Step number three is to determine transaction price. The transaction price is straightforward, 1,000 Rand per month for 24 months. So the, trans, so the, 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 the transaction price is 24,000 Rand. There's no significant I mean, there may be a financing component, but let's say it's, it's non-significant. 
There's no variable consideration. There would be a variable consideration if you're, an, if you're an open contract. Assume you're not an open contract. There's no non-cash consideration and maybe um, they will assess whether there's any refunds, hardly any refunds when it comes to cell phones and those type of stuff. So assume there's nothing. So therefore the transaction price is simply 1,000 Rand times 24 months. So it's 24,000 Rand. Now we come to step four. We need to allocate the 24,000 Rand, the, the transaction price of 24,000 Rand between the performance obligation that we identified, which is the, the, date, um, the, the handset and the data. The way you're gonna do that, step one, determine the standalone selling prices. We don't have to do that, they'll give it to us. So let's assume that the standalone selling price, it is, um, how much is the phone now? 15,000. So a phone is 15,000. And let's just assume that one gig data, I'm gonna make up, I don't know what it is. One gig data is, well, let's say the phone is 20,000 Rand and one gig data, let's just say it is um, 500 Rand, okay? I'm making up stuff, okay? So 500 times 24, 500 times 24. So therefore, the phone is 20,000 Rand standalone selling price if you have to buy it separately. And the um, if you have to buy the data separately, it is 500 Rand for one gigs of data per month. So over 24 months, it is 12,000 Rand. So therefore, if you add the two together, it comes to 32,000 Rand. Now, the contract price, the transaction price is 24,000 Rand. But if you add the two standalone selling prices, it is 32,000 Rand. So there's a discount over here. Um, we will come to this, uh, the specific treatment of a discount um, in the next lesson. But let's assume that the discount is applied equally to everything. Mm -hmm. So therefore the discount just affects the whole transaction. So the way you would allocate is simply as follows. The handset as a percentage of total standalone prices. So 20,000 divided by 32,000, that gives you a, a percentage multiplied by the transaction price of 24,000. That, that is the amount that you have to allocate to the handset. Similarly, for the data, you will take the date, the data standalone selling price, which is 12,000 as a percentage of the total standalone selling prices, which is 32,000 Rand, that gives you a percentage. That percentage multiplied by the transaction price of 24,000 Rand gives you how, how much you need to allocate towards the data. So that's basically applying um, how you allocate the transaction price. So the um, allocation, not necessarily that straightforward, but that's the concept, okay? Now we come to step five. Step five is now recognizing the revenue. So if I say 20,000 divided by 32,000 times 24, that means 15,000 Rand of the 24,000 Rand must, is allocated to the handset. And if I say 12,000 divided by 32,000, times 24,000, that means um, out of the 24,000 Rand transaction price, 9,000 Rand is allocated towards the data. Now the question is, how do you recognize that 15,000 Rand of the handset? And how do you recognize the 9,000 Rand of, how do you recognize the 9,000 Rand revenue for the data? Step five is about the recognizing a revenue. You can recognize a revenue in one of two ways, either um, at a point in time or over a period of time. The standard says you must first test whether it meets over a period of time. If it does not meet over a period of time, then it is at a point in time. So remember, it is only at a point in time if it does not meet any one of the criteria of 
over a period of time. So just take note of that. So you allocate the revenue or you recognize the revenue in one of two ways, over a period of time or at a point in time. In order for it to be at a point in time, it must not meet any one of the criteria of over a period of time. So what are the criteria? There are three criteria, criterion, criteria, whatever it is. If there are three, any one of the three um, must, um, can be met. If only one is met, then it is over a period of time. Zero must be met in order for it to be at a point in time. Now remember, revenue is recognized if um, control is passed from you to the customer. So that is why we have to assess how is control passed over to the customer over a point in time or at a point in time. So let's have a look what is the three criteria. So, um, um, so basically, um, over, over a period of time, it is by, so the three criteria is as follows. Number one, the customer simultaneously receives and consumes the benefits provided by the entity's performance as the entity performs. So for example, that is um, like an example I would give a cleaning service, okay? So you benefit from the cleaning service as they provide the cleaning service, okay? You benefit from a gym contract over that 12 month period. You don't benefit from the gym contract at a point in time. You, you benefit from a gym contract over a period of time. So that meets criteria number one. So, so remember there are three criteria. Any one of the three criteria can be met. Not all three, just one needs to be met. More than one can be met, but only one needs to be met in order for it to be satisfied over time, okay? The second criteria is the entity's performance creates or enhances an asset that the customer controls as the asset is created for or as asset is enhanced. So basically, what would happen is you may be building, a, um, let's say you're doing construction and you are building a building for the um, for your customer and the contract stip stipulates that as you are building the building the um, the risk and rewards of ownership transfers to the customer so even if the building is halfway complete that halfway completed building belongs to the customer because the risk uh, the risk and rewards have transferred so control is being transferred to a customer so in that case, you will recognize revenue over a point in time. However, if the contract stipulates that the, the building will only become that of the customer once it is completed, then that's a different story, okay? The third criteria, the entity's performance does not create an asset with an alternative use to the entity. So an example over here would be you're building a specialized asset um, that only the customer can use. So maybe like it's a, if you, a, um, a company specializing perhaps, let's say in a building a plant for Cecil. So if you build some oil plant or, um, or let's say building for ESCOM, a cubic state, uh, 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 an electricity plant, only ESCOM can benefit from the electricity plant. You can, um, you, Islam can like say, okay, they don't want it anymore. And then you can take it and go sell it. You won't be able to sell it because it's specifically built for Islam's requirements. Because only Islam currently is doing electricity to a large extent. So therefore, such a um, asset, which is specifically um, being created for um, Islam, there is no alternative use for that, for that asset that you have built. Then it will, or you also recognize revenue over a point in time and not at a point in time. If it does not meet any of those three criteria, only then will it be at a point in time. So just take note of that, very, very important. So for example, with a handset, once sells, um, um, yeah, Vodacom hands over the phone 
they have no more obligation regarding that phone. The, um, the a significant um, portion of the of the uh, um, of control have been transferred from Vodacom to you as the customer. As a result, they will not um, recognize revenue over a point in time, but rather at a point in time, because they have transferred. It doesn't meet any of the three criteria. We as the data. You as a customer is basically consuming and benefiting from the data every single month. As a result, every month you are getting one gig. As a result, as the months pass, they can recognize the revenue of it nine, what was it, 9,000 grand. Okay, so just take note, the data will be over a period of time because you as a customer is consuming the, the benefit of the data on a monthly basis over a 24 month period. Whereas from the phone, once they hand over the phone, there's no other role that um, MTN Vodacom has to play in the phone operating. They're just giving you the phone, you took out the phone. So once they hand it over to you and they check, you know, when you could take out the phone, they open it up, they check that it works and all of those type of things. There may be some warranties and stuff. We will treat warranties um, we make um, in the next or in, or in the third lesson. Um, but to a large extent, it transfers at a point in time. Okay, so just take note of that. Do you guys have any questions before we go into the into a, a, a short scenario? Bakir, Lerato, Rebecca, Ryan, Tandi, Bakir? No questions. Uh, no questions. Okay. Okay, um, I'm going to give you 10 minutes. I'm going to split into groups now. Um, I think she does not hear now. Maybe she has some uh, network problems. But I'm going to split you into groups. Uh, let me just see. Okay. I'm going to split into groups now. And then you will um, discuss. Um, the, the five, five criteria. I'll tell you which five criteria you must discuss. Okay, please join a room. Uh, Lerato, can you join? Um, Lerato, are you able to join? Okay. So there we go. So room one, you should be able to see who's room one. Room one, you have three people. So you will deal with the first three criteria, discuss it, and then you give feedback to me as to what you know about, what you remember, what you understand about the, the, the five-step model. So you're gonna do the first five, the first three steps. Then room two, you will do, um, room two, you will do the, um, the, the second two steps. I'm just gonna have to, Sathi Lerato is probably having internet issues. Um, I'm gonna move one of you to room two with Fakir. Um, Tandi, I just moved you. Can you just join, please? Can you join room two, Tandi? Okay. So, um, so room one, okay, so now you're two, two. So room one, you're going to discuss um, step two and step three, whatever you understand. And remember, don't worry if you're making mistakes. That's how we're going to learn. Um, room two, you're going to discuss um, step four and step five. You're going to give feedback to me. I'm going to give you 27 minutes pass. I'm going to give you till um, 
I'm gonna give you 10 minutes till 37. Okay. You can start.
Um, okay, Fakir, Tan, do you want to give me some feedback? Okay. Okay, I joined the room and then uh, I lost connection, but then I joined back in. But I remember what you lost it. We must discuss the five principles. Okay. Okay, so uh, so you need us to go through it. And yeah, just do you have anything? Okay, cool. So uh, the five different things that you must consider in the five steps is first you have to identify the contract. And then you have to identify the performance obligations within the contract. And then you have to identify the transaction price. Um, the next one is you have to allocate the transaction price to specific performance obligations and then determine the revenue. So when you identify the contract, you need to make sure it's like a, an agreement between the two parties, you know, a verbal or written agreement, anything like that. And then when you identify performance obligations you have to consider um you have to consider a couple of things there but um okay um Danny, on a, any things from your side to add yeah can I ask a question What do you mean? How do you know what? How to answer a revenue question? I think I'm going to tell you. So um, you you if they, if they just say discuss a revenue, then you have to apply the five steps. If you, but in most cases they're not going to ask you to do all five steps. They'll ask you to discuss um, two of the steps, and they'll tell you which two. Then. Um, so, for example, if they ask you to discuss the, um, to determine the performance obligations, then you will say, in order to determine the performance obligations, a, a, an entity have to have to assess at inception of the contract um, whether goods are distinct or not. Um, and you will say why. Then you will discuss whether and what makes goods distinct and, and then you will apply to the scenario whether whatever was whatever is within the contract actually um, whatever goods or services that is promised within the contract meets the criteria. Um, you, have to, you have to demonstrate based on the, the circumstance and the information given in the scenario whether it meets the criteria. So for example, in order for um, you have to determine at the inception of a contract, the different performance obligations within um, a contract, okay? So whether the goods or services promised in the contract results in one performance obligation or more than one performance obligation. So you'll make mention. Then you will say in order for um, to have more than one performance obligation, you, you need to determine or you need to assess whether the goods or services within the contract are distinct. Then you will tell them, in order for goods or services to be distinct, it mean um, it needs to meet two criteria. Criteria number one, it must be both, not all. It must meet both. Criteria number one, for a good or service to be distinct, it must be capable of being distinct. That's criteria number one. Then you tell them what does that mean? Being capable of, um, in order for a good or service to be to be, um, to be capable of being distinct. It should be um, it should be able to be sold or consumed separately. So there's different examples. So you'll just choose the one that relates to the scenario. Then um, criteria number two, it must also meet criteria number two that the goods or services that are distinct are distinct within the context of the scenario. Um, you just say that, and then you explain um, if the scenario 
can you explain, given a scenario, whether those goods or services are distinct and then are they distinct within the context of the scenario? So given the example I explained regarding the cell phone contact and given the example I explained using the construction contract. So that's basically how you, and then you conclude. Then you move to the next criteria, if they want the next criteria. Um, so yes, yeah, so the question will guide you. The only thing they'll guide you on is telling you what part of the revenue contract model they want, then you must discuss further. So basically that is how it will be. If they're silent, if they're silent, um, you will have to discuss all five, but where they're gonna mark you on is seeing, are you able to apply your judgment? It does not mean that you must use, um, so let's say that there's 25 marks. Let's just say it's 25, 30 marks. So you can expect a 20, 25, 20 to 25 mark question on the revenue discussion. With this discussion comes numbers. So let's just assume they don't tell you which of the five steps. They just say discuss the, the revenue in terms of the five steps. That means you must discuss all five. So you can have to go through all five, but what they're also testing is whether you are able to identify which steps are more significant than the other. It does not mean that it's 20 marks, that it's four marks for each step. Certain steps will only draw one or a half a mark, because you're just going to state it and how it meets. But then other steps will draw seven, eight marks, and another step will draw two, three marks. So that is also a thing to test whether you are able to determine by using your judgment which steps of the model is more significant than the other given the scenario. So that's basically, but they will guide you to some extent. So for example, the question, I'm not gonna cover it tonight because no one's here. So we will just do the full question one time in the next lesson. So I'm gonna do 2020 with you guys. Um, so there's a 11 marker and then there's a 20 marker, both revenue. So 11 plus 20 is 31 marks for test, test two of last year, 30 marks revenue. Um, I think the entire question was revenue. There was no joint arrangements, if I remember correctly. I just read through the recent, um, earlier today. Um, but basically, at least 31 marks is revenue, if not the full 40 marks. So what you're going to know, revenue is going to be mainly discussion um, or it's going to be journals. But in, as part of discussion, as part of journals, you must also be able to do calculation. So it's hardly ever going to be a pure calculation. It's either going to be discussion or journals. Okay, so I'm going to stop here for tonight and then we will continue next week. I'm going to check my calendar. I'm going to try to um, pop in another one over a weekend where we can go through some more revenue questions. But I'll stop here. In the next lesson, we will cover some of the further details and then the actual question as well. I, I, was, I actually prefer everybody to be here before I do a, a full question. Okay, is that, is that cool with you guys? Do you have any other questions at the moment? Uh, no, no. Yeah. Dante, any more questions? Okay, cool. So I'll see you guys next week and we'll cover a, um, a full revenue question. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you guys. Bye-bye.